Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Giuseppe Stellardi. I'm the Italian tutor here at St. Hughes. So welcome to TOYA, all TOYA members, and welcome to our two guests tonight. And I'm going to introduce our two distinguished guests. Uh, Luciano Bertoli uh, was born in Brescia, North Italy, and uh, he, he studied at the drama studio in Milan and at the Conservatorio Musicale Venturi in Brescia. Uh, and I think the combination of uh, drama and music remains very close to the center of his uh, interest and his, uh, his activities. He is a well-known actor and director, very active in Italy and also abroad. He has collaborated and collaborates <coughs> with many theatrical companies, music ensembles, uh, with other directors and cultural associations. Uh, what particularly interests me is that his uh, performances are characterized by the exceptional cultural quality and also by a high degree of involvement in topical and societal issues. And I think it is sufficient to mention some of the literary and philosophical texts that have provided the basis uh, of some of, the, of his spectacles to, uh, to, to, to realize this. For instance, he has been <coughs> performing on Tolstoy, the Kreutzer Sonata, uh, Plato, Phaedrus, the Apologies of Socrates and Crito, uh, Hemingway, the Old Man in the Sea, uh, the Bible, the Book of Job, and the Book of Jonas, also one of the meditations by Pope, uh, Paul VI, Pensiero alla morte. And then there is also an imaginary dialogue between Falcone and Borsellino, the two prominent Sicilian judges, you will know this, killed by the mafia, who have become a symbol of the fight against uh, organized crime in Italy. So I think you can see the mix of uh, interest, uh, both cultural and, uh, and current. Um, Luciano has taken part in many festivals as well as music and theatre seasons throughout Italy and in Brescia recently has performed in the presence of the President of the Italian Republic. Tonight, however, I will present <coughs> another aspect of his versatile professional activity that is his moving and fascinating readings, renditions uh, from Dante's Divine Comedy. Luciano has presented, I believe, 10 performances, possibly even more, uh, so far in Italy based on Dante's poem. And he's therefore a veteran of this particular genre. The reading of Dante's texts will be introduced tonight by our second guest, Gianfranco Seriolo. Gianfranco is an old friend. He was here in this very college a couple of years ago. <laughs> as a student, as an Erasmus uh, student um, in music college. And this is how we met in this, this college. Uh, from that acquaintance derived, derived not only a solid and lasting friendship, but also a long-standing academic collaboration, which has allowed us to send to the Iseo Lake region, which, by the way, if you don't know, it is it's a very beautiful part of North Italy, around Lake Iseo, uh, to send a large number of our students here from the Modern Languages Department as English language assistants in the local schools. Don Franco now teaches Italian literature in schools and coordinates a large program of English learning, but also does a lot more, including singing and playing the bagpipes. <laughs> He's a brilliant organizer of all sorts of cultural initiatives, including several editions of a Café Letterario, where all sorts of cultural topics are presented and discussed, a summer course on Dante for university students, and, as I mentioned before, numerous readings from Dante in collaboration with Luciano. Don Franco is in fact truly passionate about Dante, and after Oxford, both he and Luciano will travel to York University, where next Wednesday they will deliver a reading and a detailed analysis of Canto V of, uh, of the Inferno. Canto of Francesca da Rini. Tonight, we're going to hear a selection of passages from Inferno, uh, from Canto 3, 5, 
26, uh, 32, and 33. So a selection of different characters, and points, crucial points of, uh, of Inferno. And you, you, have, you should have a copy of the text with a translation uh, as well. So enough with preliminaries. Uh, uh, let me now uh, leave the room to uh, uh, Luciano and Gianfranco, and please help me in welcoming them. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for uh, attending. I hope Luciano Bertoli and I can do some justice to the great kindness that Giuseppe Stellardi, a renowned teacher of this glorious university, has shown us in introducing uh, this dantesque evening and uh, both uh, of us. Um, I would like to express my personal thank you to, to him for having given me the opportunity to come to this college, St. Hughes, uh, at which, uh, as far back as 1995, not two years ago, 1995, uh, I studied as a visiting student for uh, one year. So I remember very well this place and uh, uh, I have a very, very, very good memory. Um, thank you to Margherita, thank you to uh, Spencer, he's, he'll probably is not here now, okay, uh, for uh, having made all necessary arrangements and of course Dulcis in Fundo, thank you to the Oxford Italian Association for having, for having scheduled uh, this uh, Dantesque event uh, and for having invited us. Um, I'm eager to introduce a reading of Luciano Bertoli for more than one reason. I stop at two, don't worry. The first one, he's a renowned Italian actor and whom many people uh, esteem for, uh, for, uh, for his uh, uh, performing sensibility. He will bring Dante's verses to life. So you'll, you'll hear uh, this evening. The second uh, reason is, is personal. Uh, we have uh, worked, uh, collaborated on uh, uh, several um, Dantesque uh, projects during the last 12 years, so he's a long-standing friend of mine. Uh, before we begin, I have a confession. Uh, I haven't really used my English since 1995, so uh, I'm not joking. So um, I thank you all in advance for your patience, for your understanding, because um, I'm really going to miss hundreds of S's and prepositions. I don't use prepositions. And I'm going to use a language in between Italian and uh, English. So thank you very much for your understanding. Uh, so why are Luciano and I here this evening? I think that when an Italian association outside of Italy organizes a reading of Dante, the event is both uh, an honor and uh, a duty. Those of us who live in Italy must accept the invite. I think that Italy, in its history, has represented and represents many things, you know. Good, perhaps not so good, but uh, among these there is culture, in the broadest sense of this term, which is one of the few things uh, of which Italy doesn't suffer any kind of inferiority complex towards other, other, other countries, I'm sure. And um, I think that our art and our culture are among the biggest uh, contribution to uh, humanity that uh, allow our, us Italians to walk in the world with our heads held high. Uh, we have created a good deal of culture and it is unusual, you know, we look around us <clears throat> and we see that, uh, we see that uh, 
the words of a man can be, well, we are in Oxford, beautiful or ugly, uh, <clears throat> innovative, redundant, um, useful, useless, but only few of them can be called culture. So let me define in two minutes what I, I, uh, what's the meaning from my point uh, of view about this, uh, about this, uh, about this uh, word. Um, of course, you know that uh, the term cultures derived from the Latin color to cultivate. Obviously, it doesn't mean to cultivate a field, but instead uh, the mind and uh, the spirit. This is why uh, we should pronounce this term with the uh, utmost respect. But I think that there are similarities between the work that a farmer must do to, to grow a plant and what we do to educate our spirit <clears throat> on the beautiful and on the good. Both are activities that require time, patience, courageous choices made at the right, at the right moment. I think that Culture is something that it is difficult to reach. It's a, a, lifelong, a lifelong process that involves a lot of, um, a lot of actors, families, uh, political situation, uh, economic and social possibilities, people that we meet. And among these, I think that school is probably well, is a prominent one. If you want... Uh, it's not because I'm a, a teacher. If we want a, a healthy society, we, have, we need a, a good quality school. I have a, a classical education, so I, I have a, a humanistic view of life. But I am very worried about the, the evident drift of our educational systems towards only a scientific view of the world. I don't like it at all. I think that this process can only impoverish men. I think that our world needs much more poetry. When I speak about poetry, obviously I use this term as a synonym of, of art in general. <clears throat> poetry is, is important because poetry speaks of, uh, of sentiments and sentiments are the material men are made of. Okay, so our school should teach more poetry, yet do it in a more proper way. Uh, I can't stand it when students are bored with poetry. When it happens, so, uh, it means that uh, school is not working properly. How many people in Italy hate the Divine Comedy? In England, Shakespeare, in Spain, Cervantes, as a result of their scholastic experience. We have to decide what school should really teach. We teachers should must convince ourselves that very few of our students will become Oxford professors, absent in Uria Verbis. But everyone, but everyone needs to become woman or women worthy of this title. So I think that poetry uh, must play his role in this process. There is a time in their life, usually at school, when people decide if they love or if, if they don't love music, art, poetry. We teachers must be there and help them to choose uh, with, with this import, important choice. The problem is that sometimes uh, we teachers are the problem. Uh, we are happy when our students know that Dante was born in Florence between May and June of 1265. This is not Dante. This is not Dante. This is Dante's birthday certificate. Or I don't know. Okay? The true sign of loving Dante probably is when our students uh, sing Amor canullo amato mar perdona in the shower. Yes, we don't have to memorize, we have to interiorize, I don't know if it's possible to use interiorize okay, as, a, as a, a term. It is important. It's very complex what uh, I'm going to say, but uh, I think that we, we can't force the idea of the beautiful on our students. But since it is an important, 
it is something of important in our spirit. We must, we teachers, must find a way to harmonize with people. And I think that uh, we can do it more easily through poetry than through numbers and, and name. Think, if a school manages to transmit the tenderness that there is uh, behind uh, the tragic but eternal love that ties Francesca and Paolo, if that school manages to make us feel a bit of the fire that pushes Ulisse to renounce even his dearest loved ones, if that school manages to convey the tragedy of a father, Count Ugolino, who bites his hands from the pain while, he see, while watching his children dying in front of him, if uh, it is the case, then I'm sure that our students will not be able to stop reading the Divine Comedy. In that moment, the miracle would, would be accomplished, and we, we would have played an important part in all of this. Because, because we would, why? Because we would uh, have cultivated the spirit, which is the highest thing that we could ask of a parent, a teacher, even a country. To teach people to, uh, to teach people to uh, how how to say, um, to love to love a man, to love the words that uh, we make with our hands. We know that that men can do terrible things. And just switch on your television, a, you have a, a proof. But men could be a great creature. When man creates the beautiful, he rises above his miseries. Delevavit Medeus de Stercore. Man manages to touch his creator with a finger, like in the creation of Adam by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. In that moment, man is very similar to, to, uh, to God, and God stares at man. Book of Genesis, and God saw how good a man was. Et vidi Deus quod esset bonum. Et vidi Deus quod esset bonum. This is the first declaration of love ever. If God can love men, I think that our school must teach faith in men. And we can do it through poetry. I'm sure about this. Thus, this evening, while speaking of the Divine Comedy, we are also creating culture, something of beautiful. And uh, since the beautiful <clears throat> is one of the ingredients of culture, I think that Dante intended to create culture by writing something so beautiful. The problem is uh, our idea of the beautiful corresponds to that of Dante. It's a problem that we have to solve because we are speaking about the beautiful. But what's the beautiful related to the divine comedy? Between Dante and us, there has been the Renaissance, for instance. And then between the 19th and the 20th centuries, there was the aestheticism, two moments that uh, emancipated the concept of the beautiful from a series of moral and social obligations. For instance, today, we say that the beautiful is a personal criterion. I don't agree at all, but it's a problem of mine. Today, we say that uh, something is beautiful for itself, the ars gratia artis, okay? Today, but for people in ancient and medieval times, so even for, therefore, even for uh, Dante, it was by no means like this. I saw everything changed. Out prodesse volunt, out electare poete. This is Horace, great author of the first century before Christ. Poets want to be useful and to the light. Useful and to the light. It's important. This was written in 
the Ars Poetica, also known as Epistola ad Pisones, one of the very few works, classical works, known by Dante, who, uh, contrary to what we might think, was a reader of very few books, not because he didn't like to read them, this is a problem of my students, but uh, uh, because he, didn't, he literally didn't have a book to read at his disposal, but he certainly knew this work by Horace, a fundamental work, work which uh, set the standard not only for other Latin words, but also for medieval ones. Poets want to be useful and then to the light. So, there isn't a work of art in the medieval uh, world with the sole purpose of distracting, entertaining. There isn't. The beautiful had to uh, coincide with the educative, educational act, with, the, with an elevation towards the absolute. This idea was born with Plato in the first century before Christ, Athens, and then carried over into Christianity. Think of the frescoes in churches. If we visit them like, like tourists or like, uh, like scholars, we only gather their formal characteristics, and we lose everything else we, they want to represent. Mark my words, please. Religious art doesn't have its own life. It wasn't born to be pleasing on the eyes, but to teach the soul through the eyes, per oculos, ad anima. We could say the same thing about religious music, per aures, ad anima. That which we, that we, that which we deem a pleasure of the eyes or the ears, which we, that which we define as the beautiful is simply a way of uh, making a learning process captivating when it is otherwise difficult. If we don't understand this, the ancient works of art, uh, it, and so the Divine Comedy, uh, only transmit to us the form, the appearance, but on the substance, to use some philosophical categories. And Dante, and Dante, uh, knows very well the beauty of his work. In fact, he, he says that God himself collaborating in writing it. In Paradise 25, eh? uh, Poema sacro, cui posto mano e cielo e terra, this sacred moment which uh, both heaven and earth has set their hand. The form. Slow down. Letter number 13 of Dante. Finis operis est removere vivente sinac vita de statu miserie e perducere statum felicitatis. I translate, the purpose of my work, says Dante, is uh, distancing the living from the state of sin and leading them to happiness. So the purpose of the Divine Comedy is not the pleasure of the reader, the form, but his salvation, the substance. After, it may happen that after one of our <coughs> lectures uh, together, someone asks me why so many people still read the Divine Comedy, 700 years old, oh, come on, and slow down. I answer that it isn't so strange, there are scholars who dedicate themselves even to more ancient work. But the impressive number of readers of this work tells us that it isn't some kind of um, archaeological fashion. I mean, when we read the Divine Comedy, we are not like a scholar of paleography who is in, in an abbey and uh, pulls out uh, an old manuscript from a shelf, uh, blows out uh, of the dust and reads something that uh, speaks of a world, a culture that has disappeared, that doesn't directly speak to, to, to him. We are not like him. So why do we still read the Divine Comedy today, after 700 years of life? Homo sum humani niki lame alienum puto. Terence, great writers of the second century before Christ. Great. He says, 
I'm a man, and so I believe that nothing is a stranger to me if it is human. Parents, together with Dante, Shakespeare, and Freud, probably is the most genius psychologist in history, because in his six comedies, only six, he died at 26, he demonstrates an incredibly deep understanding of man. In this quote, this very short quote, he helps us to distinguish between book writers and uh, writers, true writers, poets. The former just write books, perhaps many and successful ones, I admit, but we know that success is owed to many factors. The latter instead uh, speak to men, and because man doesn't change in his essence, they work immortal works. They, they write immortal words. Because their messages uh, always, uh, their message continues to speak to the reader. It's funny because uh, if we think about uh, the representation of the soul in the medieval era, Dante was certainly not a pioneer. Now, so in literature, there is proven uh, influence on him uh, from several, from several um, literary works from North, from North Italy. Not to mention the suggestion given by the sixth book of the Aeneid by, by Virgil, but also uh, from a symbolic point of view when he described his inferno, he certainly had in his mind uh, uh, the mosaics of his, uh, from his Bel San Giovanni, the wonderful baptistry uh, of Florence. So where does uh, Dante's originality lie? Well, it lies in the fact that when he, this, when he uh, creates, creates his uh, majestic uh, moral fresco, he doesn't stop at two dimensions, but he adds a third dimension. That is, he gives us depth, he has perspective, much like what was happening uh, in painting in those same years, thanks to another great friend of, uh, friend of uh, Dante, Giotto, Giotto da Bondone. I mean, when Dante, when Dante introduces the souls he meets, he simultaneously conserves and exposes their own personal history. This makes them feel like one of us. This makes them credible. He said before, Dante adds a, 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 a psychological analysis of the character. But now, I want to I have to cut a little bit because we have a guest here, sorry. Uh, it's time to look at all of these uh, with examples from this evening. We are, they, uh, they are all from Inferno. Yeah. Uh, we start with uh, Ignavi. Yeah. Secondo. Uh, we are about to encounter the Ignavi. Who are they? Well, they are souls that. Uh, in life, they don't sin, but nor, uh, nor did they do good. So this is their problem, because as you know, in hell, uh, hell is populated by those who chose to behave badly. And uh, likewise, uh, in heaven, uh, heaven houses those who chose to behave well. This, is, uh, this idea is precisely from the religions that uh, liberate man's ultimate destiny from predestination, from God's will. Now, if you remember from school, Faber, Estue, Quisque, Fortuna, uh, man is responsible for his own destiny. This is Sallust. Of course, this first great first century author uh, referred to the earthly life of man, whereas Dante refers to the eternal life. But I think it doesn't change very much. In medieval frescoes, um, the divine justice is often represented by the weighing of the souls by the Archangel Michael. 
And truthfully, this same thing uh, already happened in ancient Egypt. In uh, chapter 125 of the book uh, of death, we witness, we witness the weighing of the heart of the deceased. The heart was placed on the first plate of the, of the scales, whereas uh, a feather, uh, which symbolized justice, was placed on, on the second plate. So justice was made, uh, the judgment was made uh, on the works of man, not on his intentions. Homo faber, homo faber. Man must make, must build, must uh, leave traces of himself. Etiam capillus unus abet umbran sum. Even a single hair uh, makes his own shadow. This is Pablo Cyrus, a great author from the first century before Christ. So everything in life is the fruit of a choice. And the Nyavi didn't choose. Here they are. They didn't choose. So they are not bad people or good people. They are half people. This is why they cannot be put in the place, in, in the place of, of penance, not so in that of, of uh, eternal reward, because men are placed there. They are half men. They are half men. These souls uh, didn't accept the privilege that God endowed upon men. Free will, the power to choose. So these souls lowered themselves to animals, which, as we know, uh, behave according to the instinct. So we are going to, to hear very intense reading now. And uh, the violence that uh, Mark it denotes the disdain that Dante harbors for the Ignavi. Dante is an Aristotelian, you know that for Aristotle, Man is only such when, uh, when his life revolves around the relationships. O anthropos, physi, zon, politicon, esteem. Man is by nature a social being. Physi, by nature. By nature. It means that when a man he isn't uh, active in society, he goes against his own nature. Here the, 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 the moral sentence, heavy like a border, like a border. Dante considered political activity as a social, as a social Im imperative. And he was paying with exile for his, for his choices, for having dirtied his hands. So I think that the, the most Pregnant sentence here is questi shaurati che mai non furvili. These evil men who were never truly alive. Incredible. Grazie maestro. Per me si va nella città dolente, per me si va nell'eterno dolore, per me si va tra la perduta gente. Giustizia mosse il mio alto fattore, fecemi la divina potestate, la somma sapienza e il primo amore. Dinanzi a me non fuor cose create se non eterne e io eterno duro. Lasciate ogni speranza a voi che entrate. Queste parole di colore oscuro vidi ho scritte al sommo d'una porta perché io, maestro, il senso loro mi duro ed egli a me come persona accorta. Qui si conviene lasciare ogni sospetto, ogni viltà conviene che qui sia morta. Noi siamo venuti al loco, vitto detto, che tu vedrai le genti dolorose che hanno perduto il ben dell'intelletto. E poi che la sua mano alla mia puose 
Con lieto volto, con Dio mi confortai, mi mise dentro alle segrete cose. Qui vi sospiri, pianti e alti guai risonavano per l'are senza stelle, per chi al cominciar ne lacrimai. Diverse lingue, orribili favelle, parole di dolore, accenti di ira, voci alte e fioche e suon di manconelle facevano il tumulto, il qual s'aggira sempre in quell'aura senza tempo tinta, come l'arena quando turbo spira. E io, cavea d'error la testa cinta, dissi, maestro, che è quel chiodo e che gente che par nel duol si vinta ed egli a me questo visero modo tegno l'anime triste di coloro che visser senza infamia e senza lodo mischiate sono a quel cattivo coro degli angeli che non furono ribelli né fur fedeli a Dio ma per sé fuori Cacciano i cieli per non esser men belli, nello profondo inferno li riceve che alcuna gloria i rei avrebbero degli. E io, maestro, che è tanto greve a loro che lamentarli fa sì forte, rispose, dice Rolti, molto breve, questi non hanno speranza di morte, la loro cieca vita è tanto bassa che invidiosi son d'ogni altra sorte. Fama di loro il mondo esser non lassa, misericordia e giustizia li sdegna, non ragioniam di loro, ma guarda e passa. E io che riguardai Vidi un'ansegna che girando correva tanto ratta che d'ogni posa mi parea indegna e dietro le venia sì lunga tratta di gente chi non avrei creduto che morte tanta n'avesse disfatta. Poscia che io avebbi alcun riconosciuto vidi e conobbi l'ombra di colui che fece per viltà del gran rifiuto incontanente intesi e certo fui che questa era la setta di cattivi a Dio spiacenti e ai nemici sui questi sciaurati che mai non fur vivi erano ignudi e stimolati molto da mosconi e da vespe che erano ivi e le rigam lor di sangue il volto che mischiato di lacrime ai lor piedi da fastidiosi vermi era ricolto facciamo aperto quindi now we are to meet one of the most famous couple of lovers of literature ever and I don't want to offend your English sensibility, but I'm not going to talk about Romeo and Juliet. They are Italian, so. Uh, we are in the second circle, and uh, we are introduced uh, uh, to the first sinners of the Divine Comedy, the last full. As you know, the hell has, hell has the, the, the shape of a funnel, and the worst sinners are found below. So. The more serious their fault, the closer they are to Lucifer, who is at the center of, uh, the, of the earth. So, the last fool, who are at the top of the funnel, have a less serious fault than the rest. So, it's important to remember that uh, uh, for Dante, well, for the Catholic Church, I think, <laughs> you don't go uh, to hell for a specific sin. Dante meets uh, uh, famous last fall sinners in hell, in purgatory, in purgatory and uh, in paradise. I remember that my teacher at Liceo said that paradise is full of last fall and we were uh, 
we were teenagers, so we had a very relieved expression. Okay, so we can, it's a good, it's a good place. Damnation is not given by a specific sin, but uh, by non repentance. Non repentance. Errare humanum est perseverare diabolicum. Uh, making mistakes is human. To keep making, to keep making the same mistakes is uh, uh, di diabolic. This is Saint Augustine, one of the one of Dante's favorite author as well as Petrarch. So it is uh, important to uh, to remember this. The story is well, is well known. It's very famous. It's about um, uh, a state wedding. Okay. Francesca, young, beautiful, noble woman of uh, Ravenna, uh, must uh, marry Giangiotto, Lord of Rimini, ugly, um, crippled, violent, whom she doesn't love, of course. Instead, she falls in love with his younger brother, Paolo, called Il Bello, the beautiful. We don't know if uh, he were really handsome or handsome compared to the ugliness of the brother, but this Dante doesn't say. Anyway, the fact is that the two brothers-in-law uh, unfortunately doesn't stop a sweet sight. After having discovered the adultery, the husband uh, kills uh, the two lovers uh, altogether at the same time. But what is, uh, what is inter interesting is that uh, Dante doesn't tell us this. It's not interesting, the you know, Roman noir and the Gothic aspects, uh, which uh, everyone already knows. He, Dante investigates the spark from which uh, uh, such a violent passion was born. Passion which overwhelmed not only the earthly life of the two, but which also condemned them for eternity. And what's the result of this investigation? Well, the fact that uh, Paolo and Francesca made the mistake of confusing an instinct with love. Che la ragion sommetto non talento, to use the words of Dante. Uh, love leads to life. Whereas this instinct has brought them to death. So they are two things that uh, cannot be confused. They are ontologically different. Certainly the delicacy which we, which with uh, this murky, murky, murky affair uh, is described uh, denotes a particular human piety of the author towards the two protagonists. But I would like to highlight that Dante focuses on some specific aspects, and uh, among them, I want to recall them two, uh, two of them uh, this evening. The first one, briefly. This is a great page of literary criticism. We said before that in the, in the medieval ages, literature can't only delight. It must also culturally teach, morally fortify. And these two fell in love with reading per diletto, says Dante, for pleasure. So the reading is uh, um, sterile, wrong, dangerous, dangerous, of course, dangerous. I think that Dante uses the figure of Francesca, so kind, delicate, true, medieval milady, has his last tribute to the past. He uses her to bid farewell to almost three centuries of erotic literature and of leisure that he condemns for its uh, morally dangerous nature. But there is a second aspect that I would like to bring to your attention very briefly, that is very important, unique. Dante's feminism. Dante's feminism. We are uh, in, the, in a masculine period, like the Middle Ages, the Divine Comedy, a sacred poem, Poema Sacro, <coughs> Poema Sacro. This, the Divine Comedy opens and closes with two women. Never happened before. 
Francesca and Maria. The first one embodies <clears throat> the human passion of an emancipated woman who wants to determine her own destiny. Great woman. She could plausibly be the literary daughter of Antigone, the protagonist of Sophocles' famous tragedy, put on stage in 442 before Christ in Athens. And then the Virgin Mary, who closes the work, is uh, the symbol of maternal love, but is the example of the highest Christian qualities. Vergine madre, figlia del tuo figlio, umile, alta, più che creatura, termine fisso d'eterno consiglio. Luz Gams. Dante. Dante, so Dante overcomes centuries of feminine stereotypes, affirming that woman doesn't have merely two dimensions of a painting, but an additional third dimension of a sculpture. She contains the complexity of human fragility and sublime sanctity. It's very important. Or incomincian le dolenti note a farmi si sentire. Or son venuto là dove molto pianto mi percuote. Io venni in loco d'ogni luce muto che mughia come fa mar per tempesta se da contrari venti è combattuto la bufera infernal che mai non resta mena gli spirti con la sua rapina voltando e percotendo li molesta quando giungon davanti alla ruina quivi le strida il compianto il lamento bestemmian quivi la virtù divina Intesi che ha così fatto tormento, enno dannati i peccator carnali che la ragion sommettono al talento. E come gli stornei ne portan l'ali nel freddo tempo a schiera larga e piena, così quel fiato gli spiriti mali di qua, di là, di giù, di su li mena. Nulla speranza li conforta, mai non che di posa ma di minor pena e come i gru van cantando l'orlai facendo in aere di sé lunga riga così vid'io venir traendo guai ombre portate dalla detta briga per chi dissi maestro chi son quelle genti che l'aura nera si gastiga la prima di color di cui novelle tu vuoi saper, mi disse quelli a lotta, fu imperatrice di molte favelle, a vizio di lussuria fu si rotta che il libido felicito in sua legge per torre il biasmo in che era condotta, e lei Semiramis, di cui si legge che succedette a Nino e fu sua sposa, tenne la terra che il soldan corregge, l'altra è colei che sancise amorosa e ruppe fede al cener di Sicheo, poi è Cleopratras, lussuriosa, Elena, vedi, per cui tanto reo tempo si volse, e vedi il grande Achille che con amore al fin combatteo, vedi Paris, Tristano, e più di mille ombre mostrommi e nominommi a dito, camor di nostra vita di partille. Poscia che io ebbi il mio dottore udito nomar le donne antiche e i cavalieri, pietà mi giunse e fui quasi smarrito. I cominciai, poeta, volontieri parlerei a quei due che insieme vanno e paian sì al vento esser leggeri. Ed egli a me. Vedrai quando saranno più presso noi, e tu allor li priega per quello amor che mena, ed ei verranno. 
Sì, tosto come il vento a noi ripiega, mossi la voce. O oh, anime affannate, venite a noi parlare, s'altri non niega. Quali colombe dal disio chiamate, con l'ali alzate ferme al dolce nido, vegno per l'aere dal voler portate, cotali uscir della schiera ov'è dito a noi venendo per l'aere maligno, si forte fu l'affettuoso grido. O oh, animal, grazioso e benigno, che visitando vai per l'aere perso noi, che ti chiamo il mondo di sanguigno, se fosse amico il re dell'universo, noi pregheremmo lui della tua pace, poi cai pietà del nostro mal perverso. Di quel che udire e che parlar vi piace, noi udiremo e parleremo a voi, mentre che il vento, come fa, ci tace. Siede la terra dove nata fui, sulla marina dove il po' discende, per aver pace coi seguaci sui. Amor, che al cor gentil ratto s'apprende, prese costui della bella persona che mi fu tolta, e il modo ancor m'offende. Amor, che nullo amato amar perdona, mi prese del costui piacer sì forte, che come vedi ancor non m'abbandona. Amor, condusse noi ad una morte. Caina attende chi a vita ci spense. Queste parole da lor ci fuor porte, quando io intesi quell'anime offense china il viso e tanto il tenni basso finché il poeta mi disse che pense. Quando rispose cominciai oh lasso quanti dolci pensieri quanto disio menò costoro al doloroso passo poi mi rivolsi a loro e parla io e cominciai Francesca, i tuoi martiri a lagrimar mi fanno, tristo e pio, ma dimmi, al tempo di dolci sospiri, a che e come concedette amore che conoscesti i dubbiosi disiri, e quella a me, nessun maggior dolore che ricordarsi del tempo felice nella miseria. E ciò sa il tuo dottore, ma sa conosce la prima radice del nostro amor tu, hai con tanto affetto, dirò, come colui che piange e dice. Noi leggiavamo un giorno per diletto di Lancialotto come amor lo strinse, Soli eravamo e senza alcun sospetto, per più fiate gli occhi ci sospinse quella lettura e scolorocci il viso, ma solo un punto fu quel che ci vinse quando leggemmo il disiato riso essere baciato da cotanto amante. Questi che mai da me non fia diviso, la bocca mi baciò, tutto tremante. Galeotto fu il libro, e chi lo scrisse? Quel giorno più non vi leggemmo avanti, mentre che l'uno spirito questo disse, Sì che di pietà de io venni men, così come io morisse, e caddi come corpo morto cade.
Incredibile, eh? Well, if Inferno speaks of the man without God, no canto in the Divine Comedy um, explores this theme with the intensity and richness than the 26th. We are going to see how Dante builds the character of Ulisse, uh, who only partially maintains the characteristics of the Greek. For the hero of the Odyssey, on the one hand, uh, the 10 years of navigation are due to the hostility that the god of the sea, Poseidon, has against him. But his goal is uh, always to return to his wife, Penelope, to return to his son, Telemachus, to return to his motherland, the stony Ithaca, eh? the Tracheia Ithake, according to the Greek of Homer. In Dante's Ulysses, uh, on the other hand, uh, the journey is uh, ontological. It's not forced, ontological. Because life itself is a journey. Odo i poro, io es men, ento bio tutto. We are all travelers, well, odo i poro, walkers. Eh? In this life, said uh, Basil the Great in, the, in uh, the fourth century, we are all travelers in this life. So the journey is different from the, Homer, from the Ulysses of, of Homer and uh, what we are reading now. Uh, life is, uh, now with Dante, is the time that we have been given to become man and woman, okay? And uh, Ulysses knows very well what, is, what makes the difference between animal and man. What is it? Knowledge. Knowledge, nati non fosta viver come bruti, ma perseguire virtute e conoscenza. If you don't know, you can choose. You live according to nature, no? according to instinct. If you know, you can choose. You can choose also to die and how to die, Ulysses. The greatness is the power. When, when, when you can choose, you are a man, okay? Knowledge. But what's knowledge to Ulysses? What's he really interested in? During his long journey, 10 years, long journey, he, uh, he doesn't care about cities or monuments, but men. He's literally obsessed by men. Something complex, ever changing. Homo est minor mundus. Homo est minor. Man is a word in miniature, said Severan Boethius in the 6th century. But a great author. Man is a word in miniature. And Ulysses would have agreed with him. His vocation for psychology is clear when he tells us about uh, l'ardor che io ebbia di venire del mondo esperto e dei vizi umani e del valore. The burning desire I felt to to gain experience of the world, of human vice and worth. That's a great man, open-minded. He seems to, to hear uh, Leonardo and Galileo. So what's wrong with Ulisse, with our hero? The obsession to obtain, to, to pursue knowledge without any sort of limit. Forgetting he's a man and here the, the theme of hubris is inserted. Hubris is a Greek term which means uh, uh, the man's inability to recognize the abyss which separates man from God and that inevitably leads to death. Um, we found uh, copious examples of these theological reflection in the Greek world. When the God 
when the gods could not stand a man too similar to them, of Tornos Tonteon, of Tornos, the, uh, the envy of gods, and they immediately punished him for this. Think of the myth of Prometheus. Also the Bible bears traces of it. Is this not what uh, the episode of the Tower of Babel teaches us? The difference between man and God. The problem is that Ulysses is not Christian. He can't learn from the Bible. He can't have a, an eternal vision of existence. From him, the curtain of life falls inexorably with death. So he doesn't want to lose even a second of his life. He wants to know everything. Even if it is the last thing he does, he has the problem, the problem with, with Dante's Ulysses hubris. Because knowledge is not bad in itself. But he thinks of being able to pursue it with his sole poor human means is the problem. The lack of God, no? If we, if he were here this evening, Ulysses uh, would change the Oxford University motto to Ego sum illuminatio mea. Yes. Ego sum illuminatio I am the only source of my, of my knowledge. This is Ulysses. And so he, well aware of the tragic epilogue of his choice, but still coherent with himself, he directs his ship beyond the pillars of Hercules, the boundary of humans, which uh, was the, written the, 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 the warning, neck plus ultra, neck plus ultra. Do not go further. You are a man. Do not go further. I hear why the Divine Comedy is a, a classic, you know, because it speaks now, because he had done neck plus ultra. Dante poses a question still relevant now. It's even here. Is there a border, or rather, does man have to give himself an ethical boundary? with respect to what he can achieve? Everyone has an answer, an answer here, but uh, we know our poet's answer. God is not man. God is not man. Man and God, both of them can create things, but man needs a battery to, uh, to activate his machine or robot. Well, God just uh, blows uh, his uh, breath of life into his creature's nostrils and uh, he makes it a living creature. This is the abyssal difference. And Dante says that uh, this difference shouldn't be forgotten. Um, don't worry, I'm going to conclude this short uh, introduction to uh, Ulysses. But um, with this admirable meeting, this one of the, moment, the highest moment of the Divine Comedy. With this ad admirable meeting, Dante, on the one hand, uh, reiterates his uh, admiration for the classical world, from which he uh, derives characters and uh, episodes. But on the other hand, he stigmatizes his infertility, his inferiority if compared to the Christian world. A world that uh, doesn't contemplate God will not reach true knowledge, nor salvation, of course. This is why, this is, uh, the, why the invention of the noble castle you know, in, the, in the, the fourth canto, which houses the great but pagan spirits in limbo. Oh, they are limbo. Well, limbo is an area of hell. It's not paradise. But they are in limbo. Yeah. It's hell. If you don't know God, you can't reach to the true knowledge. True knowledge is, is God himself. 
we shouldn't be surprised for, about this because Dante is a pre-humanist, so his belief is nulla salus extra ecclesiam, no salvation outside the church. And um, to have equal treatment between these two great cultures, the classical and the Christian, uh, we will have to wait for the humanism, the season of thought that will be the strong dialogue between these two worlds. But it is too soon. We will have to wait until Petrarch, so another 20 years. Mm -hmm. Nice. Io stava sovra il ponte a veder surto, sì, che se io non avessi un ronchion preso, caduto sarei giù, senza essere urto. E il duca che mi vide tanto atteso disse, dentro dai fuochi son gli spirti, catun si fascia di quel che gli è inceso. Maestro mio, risposi io, per udirti son io più certo, Ma già me era avviso che così fosse, e già volevo dirti chi è in quel fuoco che vien sì diviso di sopra, che par sorger della pira dove Teocre col fratel fu miso. Rispose a me, là dentro si martira Ulisse di Omede, e così insieme alla vendetta vanno come all'ira. E dentro dalla lor fiamma si geme l'aguato del caval che fe la porta onde uscì dei romani il gentil seme. Piangevi si entro l'arte perché morta dei da mia ancor si duol d'Achille del paladio pena vi si porta. Se i posson dentro da quelle faville parlar, dissi io, maestro, Assai ten priego e ripriego che il priego vaglia mille, che non mi facci dell'attender niego finché la fiamma cornuta qua vegna. Vedi che del disio ver lei mi piego, e degli a me. La tua preghiera è degna di molta loda, e io però l'accetto, ma fa che la tua lingua si sostegna. Lascia parlare a me che io concetto ciò che tu vuoi, che ei sarebbero schivi perché i fuor greci forse del tuo detto. Poi che la fiamma fu venuta quivi, dove parve al mio duca tempo e loco, in questa forma lui parlare udivi. O voi che siete due dentro ad un fuoco, Se io meritai di voi, mentre ch'io vissi, se io meritai di voi assai o poco, quando nel mondo gli alti versi scrissi, non vi movete, ma l'un dica di voi dove per lui perduto amorgissi. Il maggior corno della fiamma antica cominciò a crollarsi mormorando, pur come quella cui vento affatica, indi la cima qua e là menando come fosse la lingua che parlasse, gittò voce di fuori e disse «Quando mi dipartì da Circe, che sottrasse me più d'un anno là presso Gaeta, prima che sia, e ne alla nomasse, né dolcezza di figlio, né la pietà del vecchio padre, né il debito amor, lo qual dovea Penelope far lieta, vince il potere dentro a me l'ardore che ebbe a divenir del mondo esperto e delle vinzi umane del valore ma misi me per l'alto mare aperto sol con un legno e con quella compagna picciola dalla qual non fui diserto l'un lido e 
l'altro vidi infin la Spagna fin nel Morrocco e l'isola di Sardi e l'altre che quel mare intorno bagna io e i compagni eravamo vecchi e tardi quando venimmo a quella foce stretta l'overcole segnò i suoi riguardi a ciò che l'uomo più oltre non si metta. Dalla man destra mi lasciai Sibilia, dall'altra già mi aveva lasciato setto. O oh, frati, dissi, che per cento miglia per egli siete giunti all'Occidente, a questa tanto piccola vigilia di nostri sensi che è del rimanente non vogliate negar l'esperienza di retro al sol del mondo senza gente considerate la vostra semenza fatti non foste a viver come bruti ma per seguir virtù e canoscenza. I miei compagni feci io sì aguti con questa orazione piccola al cammino che appena poscia li avrei ritenuti e volta nostra poppa nel mattino dei remi facemmo ali al folle volo sempre acquistando dal lato mancino Tutte le stelle già dell'altro polo vedea la notte e il nostro tanto basso che non sorgeva fuor del marinsuolo cinque volte era acceso e tante casso lo lume era di sotto dalla luna poi che entrati eravamo nell'alto passo quando apparve una montagna Bruna per la distanza e parve mi alta tanto quanto veduta non aveva alcuna. Noi ci allegrammo e tosto tornò in pianto che della nuova terra un turbo nacque e percosse del legno il primo canto tre volte il girar con tutte l'acque la quarta levar la puppa in suso e la prora ire in giù come altrui piacque infin che il mar fu sopra noi richiuso Well, the metaphor of the life. Eh? We have arrived at the final reading of this evening, unless you all ask for an encore from Maestro Bertoli. We are now in the pits of hell, where the worst sinners are punished. The traitors of family, friends, government. And these souls are so close to Lucifer symbol of pure evil that they have lost all aspects of humanity now only ex experiencing uh, um, blind hatred and eternal eternal pain the protagonist of dante encounter is a uh, golino of gerardesca count of donoratico one of the most powerful men in Tuscany in the middle 13th century. And uh, Dante, writing to the readers of his time, doesn't waste his breath recounting the history of such a famous contemporary. And uh, disregarding the historical context, our poet uh, concentrates solely on the 
psychological aspect of his encounter with Ugolino. Uh, this same approach was already used, uh, was used with, uh, with, Ra with Francesca, uh, in which Dante speaks very, very little of her background, uh, yet solidifies her, her place along with Ugolino as one of the most memorable characters of the Divine Comedy. Anyway, uh, the Count is, uh, Ugolino, is uh, <coughs> imprisoned uh, for eternity in ice, uh, gnawing, gnawing like an animal with his teeth on the skull of, of his enemy, who condemned him to death. But since Ugolino himself uh, had dealt out the death his entire life, he doesn't complain of being killed. What makes him so violent, so implacable uh, to his enemy um, results in, in the manner of death in which uh, he suffered. Quanto la morte mia fu cruda, how much my death was cruel. Ugolino seems to claim that he has always had a code of honor in terms of murdering his enemies, unlike the death in which he was served. And his history lends Dante the opportunity to portray a different side of the count, that of of a father who is not desperate for his own death, but uh, because uh, he's condemned to powerlessly watch the death of his children. And uh, um, Dante skillfully describes the escalation of uh, Ugolino's, U Ugolino's tragedy. Uh, first, uh, his placement and then en and entrapment in the tower turned prison. Second, uh, the dream that plagued him. Third, uh, the lack of food provided. And then finally, his, children, uh, his children's tragic offer for Ugolino to eat them. And upon his refusal, Ugolino forced, forced to watch each of his children died before him. I would like not to add anything else, so I don't, I, don't, I don't want to take away from the dramatic description that uh, uh, echoes, echoes his Dante. Great, great writer who manages to, um, to separate a uh, sinner justly punished from, uh, from the pain of a father uh, watching his children suffer. Noi eravamo partiti già da Ello, che io vidi due ghiacciati in una buca, sì che l'un capo all'altro era cappello, e come il pan per fame si manduca, Così il sovran li denti all'altro pose, là ove il cervel s'aggiugne con la nuca. Non altrimenti ti deo sì rose le tempi a Menalippo per disdegno, che quei faceva il teschio e l'altre cose. O tu che mostri per sì bestial segno, odio, sovra colui che tu ti mangi, dimmi il perché, disse io, per tal convegno che se tu a ragion di lui ti piangi, sapendo che voi siete la sua pecca, nel mondo suso ancora io te ne cangi, se quella con chi io parlo non si secca. La bocca sollevò dal fiero pasto quel peccator, forbendo la capelli del capo che gli aveva di retro guasto. Poi cominciò. Tu vuoi che io rinnovelli, disperato dolor, che il cor mi preme già pur pensando pria che io ne favelli. Ma se le mie parole esser di il seme, che frutti infami al traditor chi rodo, parlar 
e lacrimar vedrai insieme. Io non so chi tu sei e per che modo venuto sei qua giù, ma fiorentino mi sembri veramente quando io todo. Tu devi saper chi fui Conte Ugolino e questi e l'arcivescovo Ruggeri. O ti dirò per chi son tal vicino, che per l'effetto dei suoi mai pensieri, fidandomi di lui, io fossi preso e poscia morto, dir non è mestieri, però quel che non puoi aver inteso, cioè come la morte mia fu cruda, udirai e saprai sei mai offeso. Breve pertugio dentro alla muda, la qual per me ha il titolo della fame e che conviene ancora che altrui si chiusa. Ma ve ha mostrato per lo suo forame più lune già, quando io feci il mal sonno che del futuro mi squarciò il velame. Questi pareva a me maestro e donno cacciando il lupo e i lupicini al monte perché i pisambi del Lucca non ponno, con cagne magre, studiose e conte, gualandi con sismondi e con lanfranchi, s'avea messi dinanzi dalla fronte. In piccio il corso mi pareano stanchi lo padre e i figli, e con l'agute scane mi parea lor veder fender i fianchi. Quando fui destro, innanzi la dimane, Pianger sentì fra il sonno i miei figliuoli che erano con me e di mandar del pane. Ben se crude, se tu già non ti duoli, pensando ciò che il mio cor s'annunziava, e se non piangi, di che pianger suoli? Già erano desti. E l'ora s'appressava che il cibo ne solea essere addotto e per suo sogno ciascun dubitava. E io sentì chiavar l'uscio di sotto all'orribil torre. Con Dio guardai nel viso i miei figliuoi senza far motto. Io non piangea, si dentro in piedrai, piangeva Nelli. E Anselmuccio mio disse, tu guardi sì, padre, che hai? Perciò non lacrimai, ne risposi io tutto quel giorno, né la notte appresso, infin che l'altro sol nel mondo uscì io. Come un poco di raggio si fu messo nel doloroso carcere, e io scorsi per quattro visi il mio aspetto stesso, ambo le man per l'odor mi morsi, ed ei, pensando che io fessi per voglia di manicar, di subito le vorsi e disser, padre, assai ci fia mendoglia se tu mangi di noi, tu ne vestisti queste misere carni, e tu le spoglia. Quetami allora, per non farli più tristi, lo di e l'altro stemmo, tutti muti. Hai dura terra perché non t'apristi? Poscia che fummo al quarto di venuti, Gaddo mi si gettò disteso ai piedi dicendo, padre mio, che non mi aiuti. Qui vi morì, e come tu mi vedi, vidi io cascarli tre, ad uno, ad uno, tra il quinto dì e il sesto. Un Dio mi diedi già cieco a brancolar sopra ciascuno, e due dì li chiamai, poi che fur morti. Poscia, più che il dolor, Potè il digiuno. Quando ebbe detto ciò, con gli occhi torti, riprese il 
teschio misero coi denti che furo all'osso come d'un can forti. Vergine, madre, figlia del tuo figlio, umile e alta, più che creatura, termine fisso d'eterno consiglio. Tu sei colei che l'umana natura nobilitasti sì che il suo fattore non disdegnò di farsi sua fattura. Nel ventre tuo si raccese l'amore, per lo cui caldo nell'eterna pace così è germinato questo fiore. Qui sei a noi meridiana face di caritate giuso intra i mortali sei di speranza fontana vivace. Donna, sei tanto grande e tanto vali che qual vuol grazia e a te non ricorre sua disianza vuol volar sanzali. La tua benignità non pur soccorre a chi domanda, ma molte fiate liberamente al dimandar precorre. In te misericordia, in te pietate, in te magnificenza, in te saduna quantunque in creatura è di bontà. Or questi che dall'infima lacuna dell'universo in fin qui avvedute le vite spiritali ad una ad una supplica a te per grazia di virtute tanto che possa con gli occhi levarsi più alto verso l'ultima salute. E io che mai per mio veder non arsi più chi fo per lo suo tutti i miei prieghi ti porgo e priego che non siano scarsi perché tu ogni nube li disleghi di sua mortalità coi prieghi tuoi sì che il sommo piacer li si dispieghi ancor ti priego regina che puoi ciò che tu vuoi che conservi sani dopo tanto veder gli affetti suoi vinca tua guardia i movimenti umani. Vedi, Beatrice, con quanti beati per i miei prieghi ti chiudono le mani. 